Okay, today is October the 27th, 2020. This year will be gone before we know it. But a lot might happen between now and then. But we are not worried. Our Lord is in control of all things. He loves us. He protects us, provides for us. He is our all in all. So we're going to prepare ourselves this evening in our usual fashion, having a few moments of silent prayer to clear the decks of any unconfessed sins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your word. We thank you that you are always there for us. We can talk to you at any time. We're thankful for your word. We thank you that we can understand the whole realm of doctrine because it's based on our desire to want to learn rather than our intelligence, our IQ, our education. None of that matters. And we pray that when we do learn things that we will be able to recall them. The Holy Spirit will help draw them out of our long-term memory just at the right time because that also is part of your grace. So we pray that you will help us to focus, concentrate, and drink in full measure your word this evening with an open mind we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Lesson 38 tonight. And we're going to continue on the subject matter of homosexuality. That would also include lesbians, bisexuals, I think you might could throw transgenders in there as well. These are perversions of what God has created. And in my lifetime, it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago that this particular subject matter, homosexuality, came on the scene and has now dominated the scene. When I was in high school, I had a friend that had a homosexual brother. Nobody talked about it. As soon as he got old enough, that is, that his brother went to California. And it just wasn't talked about. And I didn't know any homosexuals. In fact, you might go weeks or maybe even a month and never even hear, hear the term. It wasn't an issue. But boy, is it ever now. And just like so many things, it just didn't happen. It just didn't all of a sudden, one day, the homosexuals started coming out of the closet. It was incremental. Little by little by little. They had a plan and they worked their plan and it worked. And today it is so disconcerting that the majority of people in this country not only accept homosexuals, I should say homosexuality, they praise it. They celebrate it. They have parades, parades about it. And when someone comes out of the closet, when someone announces that they are a homosexual or a lesbian or whatever, rather than people being appalled, they literally clap, they applaud, and, and talk about how brave this person was to come out of the closet and, oh, isn't he great? Most people who are in a family of a homosexual that comes out of the closet, I would say probably in the high 90% of them, rather than 
mourning over what happens, they either celebrate it or they say, well, I'm, I love him anyway. And that doesn't change my love towards him, so I'm going to accept him as he is. And they think that's the loving thing to do. But it's quite the contrary. I'm not saying that if you have someone in your family that becomes a homosexual and then makes it known. I'm not saying that you stop loving them. In fact, if you love them the way you should, you would explain to them what a horrible thing they are accepting and they are going to destroy their life. Because if a person continues in a homosexual situation, it's as if he has turned his back on God. And another way of saying that is God will abandon him to his own lusts and dreadful desires. That's the loving thing to do to a homosexual. And you can, of course, you, you tell them, look, I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to let you know that I can't re continue the relationship we had before. Because if I continue the relationship we had before as if nothing happened, then I'm losing my relationship with the Lord. Because it is an abomination to him. And he is more important than you. My goal in life is to please him. So in order to please him, I cannot please you. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. What it means is that it's a token of my love to show you that you're on a course of disaster. And I will not celebrate it and I will not, will not accept it. Very few people are doing the right thing. And there's a, there, there is a, always a price to be paid when you stand for truth. There have been people who did that in their family, and not only did the one that was a homosexual that came out turn against them, the, sometimes the whole family does. Sometimes you might be the only one this is applying doctrine of separation to a homosexual. And everyone else is saying, we love you anyway. You can come to our house. You can bring your lover. It's okay. It's just another alternative lifestyle. I think that this issue of homosexuality to a large degree, defines the zeitgeist, the overall condition of a country. There's never been a country that has accepted homosexuality and celebrated it the way that we have that survived. It's like thumbing your nose to God. So what we have to say here is very important. This is Lesson 38, and what I'm saying in this first paragraph is enough to set some people on edge, make enemies, but it is truth. The Bible clearly demonstrates that homosexuals and lesbians are not born with an immutable orientation for those of the same sex which have no control over and can never be overcome. <clears throat> That's what a lot, if not most, of the homosexuals are saying. And I'm going to do my best to demonstrate that this does not line up with the Bible. That is the immutable orientation that homosexuals have no control over and that can never be overcome. That's what they're saying. That's not what they said at first. At first it was about sexual preference. They had every right to choose what sex they wanted to join with. 
But then someone came up with the idea, no, we were born that way. Uh, and that gives them an excuse. They can't help it. They would never choose that lifestyle. Even though when you say that you are homosexual, most of the time people celebrate it. And it's, it's the perfect excuse. You can't fault me for my lifestyle of being a homosexual because I was born that way. And for you to fault me for something I cannot control or change is being a bigot. So we're going to deal with this. And we're going to go, if you will turn in your Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. There's a major verse on what we're talking about here. Last night I was watching, I think it was Tucker Carlson, and they were talking about this very issue. That's how relevant it is. And of course, when Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, the senator, challenged Amy Coney Barrett about using the term twice, peripheral, uh, uh, sexual preference, she said that was offensive. And it is not true that homosexuals are not homosexuals because they make a choice. They're born that way. That's what she said. And it was amazing because last night Tucker was uh, covering this and there's a woman named Tammy Bruce. She's, I think she's very knowledgeable. She's very good at what she does. And she's a lesbian. And she said that what Maisie Hirono said was very offensive to her. She said, because I was not born this way, I chose to be this way. And there are a lot of them that say that as well. So there's some kind of rift, at least some kind of distinction in the homosexual community. Some will say, I chose to be this way. Others will say, I was born this way. And I think they have one thing in common. I don't think any of them think that it's a sin. They either don't know what the Bible says or else they know what the Bible says and believe it's not true. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, we start out with a list, a list of sins. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That's just one, one sentence. Boy, does it make a big difference how you interpret that. Who are the unrighteous? And what is the unrighteousness? And what does it mean to not inherit the kingdom of God? Those are questions we must answer and to, our, uh, to understand what this verse is about. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. We already went over this in another. The effeminate are the kind of the female part of a homosexual relationship, and homosexuals here would refer to those that would be playing the man's part. We have Greek words for these. We've went over that already. That's not the point here. But these are listed in the list of sins. Actually, this is not a list of sins. This is a list of people who are identified for these things. Do not, it says, do not be deceived for neither fornicators. It doesn't say fornication. It's talking about those who fornicate. Those who fornicate are identified as what? Fornicators. And all of them are that way. It, nor idolaters. Idolaters is not the sin of idolatry. It's those who are identified as idolaters. And, and, it, and all of these are the same way. And, and when you get to the homosexuals, it's not... He doesn't say homosexuality. He says those who are identified as homosexuals, which, of course, uh, 
have indulged in homosexual acts. Verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's the second time, two times in these two verses, we have shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I'll get to that in a moment. Now, verse 11 is where a lot of, the, of what we're going to be focusing on is. And it says, and such were some of you. Were, of course, is a past tense word, were. It's an imperfect active indicative in the Greek, which means it was ongoing action. It, it just wasn't a, a person that got drunk on his birthday or maybe on the 4th of July or something. He's talking about this was their habit. That's who they were, was a drunkard. So it's ongoing sinning to the point to where they would call you a drunkard or a fornicator, whatever the word is here. It was ongoing. Middle, uh, no, let's see. Active voice means they, who, the ones who are identified as, let's say, a fornicator, did, would perform the action. An indicative mood means it's not just that they might do it, they did do it. So it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed. I have that in red because that takes a little bit more ex explanation. But the morphology of this verb is a aorist middle indicative. The aorist tense means whatever it means to be washed, it was in the past, at a point in time. It wasn't ongoing, just in a point in time. The middle voice means the subject produced the action of this verb. And the indicative mood again means it was reality. This really happened. And then it says, but you were sanctified. Again, past tense, aorist tense. This is a passive. Whatever this sanctified means, it means it's not something that they produced the action. They received this sanctification. Indicative mood means it's reality. It really happened. And then it says, but you were justified. Another verb, just like sanctified, is aristance. It took place in the past. They received it, passive voice, indicative mood. It happened. In the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. Now, I changed my notes completely from what I had last time. We did cover this last time right at the end. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be taught or at least brought up for these verses to be understood. And so I did. I just started with a numbering system. And here's the first number here. First of all, we must recognize that Paul was addressing believers in verses 9 through 11. And many, if not most people, would not agree with that. A lot of people think, well, if you're a believer, you, you, you're not going to fornicate. If you're a believer, you're not going to be a thief. You're not going to murder someone. You're not going to be a homosexual. You're not going to be guilty of, what was that one, uh, when you want somebody uh, covetous. Believers aren't covetous, covetous, covetous are, are drunkards or, revival, or revilers or swindlers. They say, that, that's just not what Christians are. All oh, those poor souls, they really don't, they don't have a reality in their mind. Christians, Christians can be the worst in each and every one of those categories. Now I have two sub-points. The unrighteous in verse 9, here it is right here, where it says, know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so the unrighteous in verse 9 is not referring to unbelievers, but to the disobedient believers who will be present at the kingdom of God, or in the kingdom of God, but have diminished opportunity. The diminished opportunity is because 
of this ongoing sinning to the point to where they're known as a drunkard or an idolater or fornicator or a homosexual. That's important to understand. I think the term unrighteous most of the time is referring to believers and the issue is whether they're going to be rewarded or whether they're going to be disinherited. Most of the time, unrighteousness, I think, is, I didn't do a search on this, I'm just going from a sense. Unbelievers we know are unrighteous. Now there are unbelievers who try to be righteous and they wind up being self-righteous, which is a sin in and, in and of itself. Point B, there's a cost for disobeying God and willfully indulging in sin, but it is not losing eternal salvation. And there are a lot of people that think that if you sin too much, you can lose your salvation. Or, if you sin with the more heinous sins, most of, it, most of the time it would be fornication and adultery comes to their mind, then you can lose your salvation. And that, that is pitiful thinking. No believer should ever have that thought. They're very uneducated with regards to grace, salvation, anything with regarding Jesus Christ and the Bible, they just don't have it if they would fall for that. There is a cost but it is for willfully indulging in sin, but it is not the loss of salvation. No one can lose their salvation. For the imputation of eternal life, the imputation of God's righteousness are gifts. They're called gifts. And in the same book of Romans here, it says that the Gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. He couldn't take them back even if he wanted to, and he does not want to. Point number two. If anyone would be denied access into heaven because of his sins, because of sins he committed, then Christ's death on the cross was useless if we are still held accountable for our sins. Furthermore, it would also mean that he lied when he said it is finished on the cross. So anyone who would go to these sins and think that they were committed by unbelievers and that is what's keeping them from going to heaven does not understand grace. And they don't understand the cross. They don't know or understand the most fundamental principles of the Christian faith. And that is that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. No one is held accountable and be and being condemned to hell for their sins. And yet if you go out on uh, just about anywhere and you say that, you're going to be in a battle royal before you can blink. And it might be a lot of Christians that are so-called Christians professing Christians that might be doing the attack. We'll give that one more time. If anyone would be denied access to heaven because of sins he committed, then Christ's death on the cross was useless. If we are still held accountable for our sins, which we are not. Not even unbelievers are held accountable for their sins because Christ took care of everyone's sins. Furthermore, it would mean that he lied when he said it is finished on the cross. There are so, some that say, I've heard Jehovah Witnesses saying this before to me because I used to, I knew several of them and I worked with them. And I, they said, well, this is the way it works. Christ did go to the cross and he paid for sins or, he, you know, he did the work on the cross. He did his part. Now we have to do our part. I said, what is your part? Well, we have to not sin. <laughs> oh, boy. 
I said, then what did it mean when he said it is finished on the cross? They didn't like that question. Anyway, point number three. The fact is, no one goes to the lake of fire because of their sins, because Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world. I know that you know that. I know that you believe that. But you have to have at least a few verses in your arsenal so that when you tell someone that no one goes to hell for their sins, you better be ready to back it up with a couple of verses or they will steamroll you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. I need to put an M right here. Christ reconciling who? The world, that would be everyone, and not counting their trespasses against them. Is Jesus Christ just? Is God the Father just? How then can a just God not count people's trespasses against them? One word, or two words, the cross. This means, and it says it right there, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He did that on the cross, and now their trespasses, those, anybody in the whole world, their trespasses are not, excuse me, uh, held against them. Why? Because Christ paid for their sins on the cross. Every sin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he himself, Jesus Christ, is the he, is the propitiation for our sins. That's a five dollar spiritual or biblical word. Propitiation just means satisfaction. Jesus Christ was the satisfaction for our sins. Who did Jesus Christ have to satisfy? God the Father. And he's saying he is the satisfaction, the propitiation for our sins. That means that Jesus, that God the Father accepted his atonement on the cross. And he says, and not for ours only, not for those who receive this epistle, 1 John 2, 2, believers, but also for those of the whole world. Try to limit that. Can you limit that? Can you limit 2 Corinthians 5, 19? Or how about 1 John chapter 1, verse 29? The next day, oh, excuse me, that's John 1, 29. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, up until that time, the only thing they could do was to cover sins with animal sacrifices. And the Bible says the animal sacrifice could never come close to propitiating God or take away sins. It was a temporary band-aid until Jesus Christ would go to the cross and do what? Take away the sins of who? Of what? The world. Can you limit that? 1 John 4:14. 4, and we have believed, excuse me, and we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So anybody that would take that scripture, the list of sins, and say, that's unbelievers and they're going to hell because they were because of those sins, they have a very grave problem. And it should be up to us in love to point out the things that I've just pointed out to you. And I know you know these things, but you have to know them well enough to make a case. The next time someone says, oh yeah, 
that person murdered his wife, he's going to hell. And if you sit there like a bump on a log and you don't step up and say, well, he might be going to hell, but not because he murdered his wife. What do you mean? Well, nobody goes to hell for their sins. Don't you know that? <laughs> and then get ready to do battle because they're coming after you. I know what I'm talking about. I was in a... Fortunately, I was the superintendent on a, a construction job. And before we started out, you know, it was 8 o'clock time to go to work. We were in there just sitting there talking. And somebody in Houston had committed a mass murder. And that's what they were talking about. There were about seven guys in there and me. But fortunately, I was the boss. And they said, boy, he's going to go to hell for sure. That. I said, no, he won't. And they looked at me. I mean, it was, you could hear a pin drop. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, nobody goes to hell for their sins. Whoa. I do believe if I wasn't the boss, I would have been physically attacked. Not one of them had a clue what I was talking about. And they, they just automatically hated me and just harangued. What do you mean? And just going on and on. They got all excited about it. And, of course, probably, I don't know, but most of them, I, I believe, would profess to be believers. And I said, well, answer me this. I said, if Christ paid for the sins of the world on the cross, how can we be held accountable for them? And they didn't like that either. Anyway, point four. Verses 9 through 11 are about believers who were the kind of people described in the list who would be disinherited at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because I said earlier, you just don't continue to disobey God without paying a price. So these were believers who were the kind. They were, they were like the people. In fact, they were the people described in the list. Not all of them, but some of them who would be disinherited at the judgment seat, of, judgment seat of Christ. What does that mean? What does that say to you when I say they are going to be disinherited? Do you know what that means? Well, just let's think of it in a physical sense, in a worldly sense. There are people in families that have disgraced their families. They have done horrible acts and the Parents or whoever it was that have the inheritance would disinherit them. They get nothing. You understand that? Well, we are children of God. And even those that have done heinous acts and been disinherited, they're still part of the family. And we're still children of God no matter what we do. And the Bible tells us that if you're not an overcomer, then you are not doing what you're, is expected of you as a believer. If you're not growing in grace and knowledge and progressing into spiritual maturity, you are not fulfilling the plan and the duty that God gave you. And there are consequences for that. People retort by saying, oh yes, but heaven is a wonderful place. I just have aspirations just to get there. And this might be a believer who has already believed in Jesus Christ and they don't know that their, their ticket to heaven is guaranteed. They don't know that. And they're working and trying to impress God to make sure that they're going to wind up in heaven. That is sad. Is it the pastors aren't teaching it? Or are they not listening? What is it? There's consequences. And they will find at the judgment seat, everyone here, see, I don't even have to explain this, but I better say something about it so there may be someone that's, that is live streaming that doesn't know what the judgment seat of Christ is. Every church-age believer one day will stand before Jesus Christ this happens after the rapture, when Jesus comes and takes us home. 
And you will stand before Jesus Christ and you are going to be assessed. What did you do with the grace and all the blessings that God gave you on earth? Did you obey the Lord to grow in grace and knowledge? Or were you fully distracted by, by the world? Now, sin has nothing to do with this. That won't even be mentioned. It's not about sins. It's about whether you're going to be rewarded, decorated, and have privileges and opportunities that others don't have in heaven. And by the way, that's for all eternity. And there will be some that will be decorated and hear, hear that great accolade, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things and what God is going to give those people we can't even imagine. It's beyond our understanding how wonderful the things are that God is going to give to those believers. But then there are going to be the ones that like received the one talent and went and hid it in the, dug, in, dug it in the ground and did nothing. That kind of person will be disinherited. They will not have inheriting rights in heaven. What are our inheriting rights? Well, I'll give you an example. If you're renting a house, you've lived there, let's say, two or three years, and you and your wife decide that you need to move a wall to open up the house, make it look bigger, and you want some furniture that's going to fit just right in there, would you just go in there and start tearing down that wall? Uh, I don't think the person who you're winning from might think that's a good idea, especially if you don't ask them. However, if you have inherited that house, you can do anything you want to to it, can't you? And in heaven, those who have inheriting rights that have not been disinherited, that have been that they received at the judgment seat of Christ, rewards, decorations, privileges, and opportunities are going to have inheriting rights in the sense that they will be able to go places and do things that others cannot. So again, number four, the verses that we have in view are about believers who were the kind of people described in the list who would be disinherited at the judgment seat of Christ, meaning that they would lose their inheriting rights in heaven, which I just described, and will not receive any crowns, rewards, decorations, or privileges for all eternity. They could have had all these things for eternity. But it wasn't important to them. Could be that they were never told. You've been told. I don't know. You, there might be a higher degree of assessment for those who have been told and still don't care about the phenomenal plan that God has given us. And i got a lot more to say about that pretty soon. You don't know what I'm talking about, but Scott does. I talked to him today when we were trained. Point number five. We will focus only on those in the list above who were identified as being effeminate and homosexual since that is our topic. What I'm going to be saying in the, in, in the rest of these uh, numbers here could refer to any of the sins on the list. But I'm, I'm putting them in focus just for the homosexuals because that is their topic. That's why we went here. Point number six. Notice that verse 11 starts with these words. And such were some of you. That means that some of the believers were identified as those who were on the list. What does were mean? When it says, some of you were, it's past tense, isn't it? It means you once were that, but now you're not. Would that not suggest to you that homosexuality is not an immutable orientation that cannot be changed? Point number seven. There are three phrases that start with the word but 
that demonstrate they were no longer practicing their former sins. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. That's why they were no longer what they were before. Whether it was a drunkard, whether it was a fornicator, whether it was a, a idolater, whatever it is, they weren't that anymore. And you have three buts to explain why. Point number eight. It should be noted that if they continued to commit the sins on the list, including homosexuality, they would still be saved but could, re could, could receive divine discipline. A good parent disciplines the children that don't obey, don't, does, don't they? God is the perfect parent. If they continued all the things in the list, whatever they were used to doing, would that mean that they would in, not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, does it mean that they would not be in heaven? I've already established that their sins are not held against, against them in the context of being condemned to the lake of fire. Point nine. But you were washed. Let me go up to there here so you can see it again. We see it in context here. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed. That's the first but. Aorist middle indicative, which I described a moment ago. So let's go down here and see about this. It's an aorist middle indicative. The aorist tense refers to a point in time. The middle voice means the subject is affected by its own action or is acting upon itself. The indicative mood means that it, it isn't just a potential, but indeed is a reality. I spent at least an hour going through journals. I have very sophisticated Bible software. And I have journals for over, I think, a 300-year period. All the things the scholars and the, the people in, uh, in the know write, even for, like I say, maybe two or 300 years back, and I can access exactly what I wanted. And I went to this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, and I have it in here, you were washed. And you know what every one of them said? I did not find one that did not reference this being God, and this took place at salvation, and God's the one that did it. That God washed them from their sins. What's the problem with that? I said the aorist tense means the subject, the person who committed the sins, did something. They, com they did an action that affected themselves, and it is an indicative mood. It is in reality. What that means is it cannot be referring to God. I don't know if these scholars were just looking at the English, because certainly you would come to that conclusion if you're just looking at the English, but when you look at the Greek and you look at the morphology of the verb, verb it, it's not talking about God. Now, why is that important? Because I'm demonstrating that those who were drunkards or thieves or whatever and homosexuals did something to where they're no longer what they were before. They did it. You got it? Washed in the Greek, this word is apoluo, A-P-O-L-O-U-O. -O -O. It means to wash something away from oneself. How could this be God washing sins away from you when, you, when the, the meaning is that you, wash, one, washes something from themselves? By the way, the word apoluo, is only used two times in the Bible. Here in Acts 22. It's when Paul was on the road to Damascus. He went blind and he was told, rise 
and uh, be baptized and wash away your sins. That's a that's a, a hard verse as well. It sounds like well, when he was baptized, he washed away his sin. But that word "washed away" is apolulo. It's the, only there. It's in the imperative mood. He was commanded to do this. Here, it's not a command. It's a, a middle voice, something that he did. Point B here, sub point. To wash off or away is used in the middle voice metaphorically. What is a metaphor? It's when you use a, another word to mean something else. So, to wash, wash off or away is used in the middle voice metaphorically to wash oneself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, literally, it means ye washed yourself clean. That's literally what it means. By the way, I'm getting this information from uh, Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of the Old and New Testament. You washed yourselves clean. Here the middle voice again indicates that the converts at Corinth, by their obedience to the faith, voluntarily gave testimony to the complete spiritual change divinely wrought in them. Uh, that's as close to the have it, uh, that I found anybody describing what does it mean to wash something away. But they were obedient to the faith. And I think that part is right. I think they made a cognitive decision to stop disobeying and start obeying. And that certainly affected them. And the next, the next phrase is that they were sanctified. That's in the passive voice. And they were justified. That's in the passive voice. Those are things that God does. We don't sanctify ourselves. We don't justify ourselves. God did that, and rightly so. They're in the passive voice. They receive. But this one is not passive. It's mental voice. So they did something to not be what they were before. That's clear. And to say that they... Wash something away? It's hard to put a figure on, I mean, to, to say, but saying right here where it says their obedience to the faith. And I'm saying what they did was make a decision to stop doing what they were doing before. Now, if they were born that way, it's a mutable orientation. They couldn't do that, could they? Now, in Isaiah 1.16, I threw this in because it has to do with the same thing where we're looking at with washing. This is Isaiah 1.16. It says, wash yourselves. This is the cow imperative. They had to be able to wash themselves or else they would not be commanded to do so. You understand that? Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds. Remove as a Hiphel imperative. They were commanded to do it. So washing yourself or has, has to do something with Remove the evil deed from my sight. And then you have the last one here. Cease to do evil, which is a cowl imperative. All these are commands, which means they could do it. God commanded them to do it. And if you go up here where it's talking about, you wash yourself clean, it seems that it goes along with removing the evil of your deed from God's sight Cease to do evil. Cease to do what you've been doing. Does that not seem logical to you? It's another language, but it's, it's translated in the same ways, and these are all imperatives that they can do. The point is, a person can stop doing what they were doing before, no matter what the sin is. And I think when it's the next two phrases that says, 
you were sanctified and you were justified means that already took place at salvation. So why are you doing these things? See, the Corinthians were hell raisers. They were guilty of every kind of imaginable sin. And Paul is telling them, say, hey, look, you're doing all these things. There's consequences. You're not going to inherit the kingdom for one thing. And why are you doing them? Because you were set apart from God at the point of salvation. You are justified at the point of salvation. Why are you doing these things? You need to stop. Does that make sense to you? It's, and I've looked at this quite a bit. That seems to be what happened. Certainly, they had to do something in the middle voice to not be what they were before. And that shows that it's not an immutable orientation. Point 10. But it says, but you were sanctified. All believers are positionally sanctified at the moment they are saved. This means that God set them apart for special blessing. They received that. That's in the passive voice. But you were justified. Each one of these, notice there's th three words that start with but to explain what's happening here. This is the passive voice. Also, you were justified. Every believer is justified at the moment of salvation based on the fact that he or she receives the imputation of God's righteousness. Why can God look at you, sinful person, and me, sinful person, and say, you're justified? Because when we believe in Jesus Christ, in that instant, he imputes to us his own righteousness. He sees his own righteousness in us and says, justified. Point 12. The Corinthian believers were committing every kind of sins. So Paul was warning them that there are consequences for that and they had better, and they had the power to stop. <coughs> Excuse me. Thirteen. I've got five minutes, and I, this one this one thing is going to take me more than that. But I'll give you a dose of it tonight, and hit you again with it Thursday night, and it'll be better ingrained in your soul. Number 13, homosexual activity is a sin which, like any other sin, can be avoided. Now, there are, uh, I'll stop right there. There's probably the majority of, homosexual, of homosexuals and lesbians and so forth would contend with you that it's not a sin. That's because they're ignoring the truth in God's word. God, God repeatedly says not only is it a sin, it's an abomination. So it's a sin no matter what anybody says. God says it's a sin. I, I believe him. It's a sin. So homosexual activity is a sin which, like any other sin, can be avoided. There are people who, for whatever reason, are sexually attracted to those of the same sex. In order to obey God, they must resist the temptation, just like heterosexual men and women must resent, resist the temptation to have sex with those of the opposite sex who is not their spouse. So we're not off the hook. I mean, we all know that we have to resist the temptations we have to be intimate with the uh, people of the other sex who are not our spouse. We're tempted by that, and we have to fight that temptation. But the homosexuals are making this contention. They're saying, well, look, we have, we're homosexuals and we have this, uh, we sin, even though they don't think, they might not contend that it's a sin, but they sin, and they, if they're going to obey God and, and try to be right before God, they have to try to fight that temptation as well. But they're saying, no, we don't have to do it because we were born that way. We have an excuse. And that just doesn't work with God. Several years ago, I had a homosexual that called me from New York, out of the clear blue. I didn't know who he was. And he started talking to me. I guess he saw it on the Internet, you know, our website. He says, I'm a homosexual. And he says, uh, will you talk to me? I said, yeah, I'll talk to you. And he started telling me his story about how all these things come along. 
And I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, I will continue to talk to you. I'll try to help you. I'll give you biblical perspective. As long as you are telling me what you're telling me now. He said he was having a really hard time not acting on the desires that he had towards other men. And I said, as long as you keep it in that context, I will continue to talk to you and try to help you. But the first time that you try to tell me that it's not a sin, we're done. He called me about, I guess, six or eight more times over a period of months. And finally, he quit calling. And I noticed that the more we talked, the more he started leaning towards it's not a sin. And he could tell I didn't like it. And I think that's why he stopped calling. So what we're saying is sin is a sin is a sin. I think there's... The reason I think God calls their sin an abomination is because it is a perversion of how God created man and woman. Fornication, adultery, those kind of sins are wrong. God commands us there and tells us our sins not to do them. But they're not perverted. It's not taking God's creation trying to pervert it into something else. So I think if we think of it that way, and if you, if you ever have a chance to talk to a homosexual, and he's trying to say it's okay, nobody can sin and say, I have an out. I have a get out of jail card. I can take a pass because it's not my fault. I was born this way. Well, we were all born with an old sin nature, were we not? And it's the old sin nature in them that is prompting them to go after for whatever reason, the same sex, but they don't want to say it's a sin. They don't want to take responsibility for it by saying they were born that way. Now, the verses that I've shown you already from the Scriptures, and I have so much more. I haven't even covered a third of what I was going to give you tonight. I knew I wasn't going to get through tonight, but I have much more. And I'm... I'm dedicating this much time to this issue because it is that important. We are being overrun, not necessarily by homosexuals in numbers. I think there's only about 1% or 2% of the people that are homosexuals. But it is the acceptance and the degeneracy and all the harm that it is doing that must be addressed. When a culture is celebrating it and you're saying the... I think the the um, suicide rate for homosexuals is like nine or ten times that of other people. And the disease, I could go on and on about the... But that's not really the issue. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you that they need to realize that we have desires too that God does not allow, and we have to fight it. And there may be times that we lose the battle, and then we acknowledge our sins to God. They don't want to acknowledge their sins because they don't think they are sins because they have believed this false idea that there is a gay gene or there's something that they were born with and they can't help it, and that is a lie. And I've already had a couple of homosexuals that have contacted me from the Internet telling me that I'm wrong, that it is, uh, they can't help it. One of them said... Um, <clears throat> You can be a homosexual and still be a believer, no problem. And I wrote him back. I don't know if he received it. It seemed like it, he didn't get it. I don't know. But I said, you are absolutely right. You can be a homosexual and be a believer. But if you are, then you do have a problem with God. Because he said, you can be a homosexual and still be a believer, no problem. Well, you can be a homosexual and be a believer, but you do have a problem. And the problem with is the Almighty. So, we will continue this in two days, God willing. Father, we thank you for this time that we can focus on these issues that are so important. We need to dissect them and think clearly through so we, we can explain to people how vast your grace is that no one goes to hell for their sins. And so a list of sins can't mean 
that it's unbelievers who are going to hell because of their sins, or even believers who continue to do these sins don't lose their salvation, which is impossible. It means they have offended you. There are ongoing disobedience, and that always has a price to pay. We want to get this straight for our own selves, but you also want to get it straight so that we can tell others because most people are completely confused about this issue, which is so important. So we pray that you will help us to think about these things, go over the notes, whatever it takes to inculcate into our soul the answer to what to so many is a dilemma. You always have the answer, and we thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.